Greetings and welcome to the 2020 Reform Party National Convention. This is our public forum Q&A with our presidential candidates. I'm Michael Hackmer and I'll be your moderator. We've had a chance to interview our different presidential candidates who are running for the Reform Party nomination. And they are Max Abramson, Soraya Foss, Rocky De La Fuente, and Ben Zion. Tonight, I have the very distinct pleasure to talk with Max Abramson. We are recording this event. We're also streaming this live on Facebook. We're gonna make this available on demand on our website, as well as on our YouTube channel. On your screen, if you're participating through the webinar platform, which we're using Big, uh, big Marker tonight, uh, you have a Q&A and a chat box, so you can please submit questions that you have in there, and, and we'll both be able to see those questions as they come in. We'll try to get to everybody's questions. We also have a lot of questions that we have mapped out already, so but please do ask your question, and we'll get to it as best we can. Uh, also, um, in addition to, to that, we for the delegates who are participating in the Reform Party National Convention, we are having our presidential nominee vote, which is taking place on Saturday at two o'clock. You should receive an email with your login information. If for whatever reason you don't get that, please let us know. Now, without further ado, I want to take a brief moment to introduce Max. Max is a state representative from the state of New Hampshire. He is seeking this nomination. And now I'd like Max to briefly introduce himself for a minute, minute and a half, uh, two minutes, sorry, Max, and uh, let us know a little bit about yourself and why you want to be president of the United States. Well, I'm uh, Max Abramson. I'm a member of the New Hampshire State Legislature. Uh, I originally announced uh, my candidacy in July of last year. Uh, my reason being that I feel that the war in the Middle East has gone on for much, much too long. And I saw a few other candidates kind of half-heartedly saying that they would bring the troops home, but I didn't see anyone making the case for it. And I think that our presidential candidates uh, and candidates for federal office really need to uh, go out and make the case for bringing the troops home. We've lost over 8,000 officially. We've had over 8,000 of our brave armed servicemen and women get killed over there. And on top of that, hundreds of thousands of civilians, journalists, DOD employees, bystanders uh, have been killed, hundreds of thousands of more, uh, by latest estimate, about 525,000. Uh, although the figure may be significantly higher, there have been hundreds of thousands more who've been blinded, had white phosphorus drop on them, including uh, small children. We've had hundreds of thousands of people lose limbs, their eyesight, uh, be uh, mutilated and burned beyond recognition. And uh, people have been scarred for life. Whole communities have been destroyed in the 18 year long war in the Middle East. I think that whatever was going to be accomplished uh, should have been accomplished immediately. I don't believe in UN style nation building. I don't believe in occupation. I don't believe that we're an empire. I believe that we're, we are uh, meant to be a republic. We maintain a very strong military capable of two mission capability. Uh, I believe that 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 military does have to be used on very, very rare occasion, maybe once a generation, to go take out uh, terrorist groups like uh, Al Qaeda, ISIS, and others. But I don't believe that that our our military or Department of Defense or the establishment in Washington D.C. is really geared for occupying, taking over, and running foreign countries. We've seen a long, long history of of disastrous and bureaucratic situations that degraded into corruption and socialism when uh, the United States government tried to occupy and control other countries. So for that reason, I, I've been making the case for bringing the troops home from the Middle East. Uh, it would be the first thing that I do as president. And I think that we need to stand together as a country and, and send a clear, clear message to Washington, D.C. that we need to do that. Thank you, Max. Uh, let's dive right into the top questions. Um, We've had 2020 has been a very difficult year for many millions of Americans. COVID-19 pandemic has caused over 40 million people to lose their jobs. But most recently, we've seen a string of violence between police officers and Americans against black Americans. It's caused for a nationwide protests and civil unrest. Many people are very uncertain about the direction of this administration in dealing with these problems. How would you handle, if elected president, trying to 
um, create a little bit more balance and restore some positivity in the country, particularly in relations with black Americans? I think that the president of the United States needs, needs to, uh, as Eisenhower used to say, serve as a kind of spiritual leader that you lead the whole country, not just part of it. And I, I feel whether uh, folks at home support Trump or don't, or they're concerned uh, uh, about a potential Biden administration, and now they're talking about Biden and Kamala Harris, whatever you think of, of the current administration, I think that he really did drop the ball on this, on bringing the, the people together. It wasn't until more than a week into the riots and looting and burning that the president finally came forward and and spoke about the importance of protecting all lives. Uh, I, I think that Dave Chappelle um, also belatedly gave a very important speech at a, at a comedy club. And he said, for eight minutes and 46 seconds, this man kneeled on the man's throat, uh, even as he cried out for his mother and said that he couldn't breathe. Uh, he literally killed the guy just out of, I, I think, sheer negligence, if not recklessness. And that was a criminal act. And there's been a, a not just in the last few years, I, I remember during the um, Rodney King riots, and I remember this was back in 1992. And even before that, back in the Watts riots in 1966, there'd been growing, growing concerns that uh, people in our society, and in particular people of color, not just blacks, but Latinos, uh, Asian Americans, Arab Americans, American Indians, who are generally forgotten by the media, um, that, that doesn't quite meet the media's narrative, um, have been kicked around a lot by our criminal justice system, by corrupt prosecutors, um, by judges. We know for a fact that Latinos on a first-time offense get 10% more prison time on a first offense, that African Americans get 15% more time and that there are all sorts of disparities with public institutions, governmental institutions, criminal justice system, uh, public schools, public buses, public rail, uh, and public housing, and those things have become increasingly segregated. Uh, that's not just a one-party problem. I think that the I think the Democrat Party today is is kind of being exposed for being completely negligent um, on this on this issue that they they were crowing about that they were fighting for civil rights and at the same time. Um, they're not actually doing anything. They're running a lot of the counties and cities that are that are in trouble right now. Uh, what I did in 2019, uh, and time to bash the Republicans, in 2019, I introduced House Bill 732, which I was sure, I didn't know if I'd get any Democrat co-sponsors, but I was sure I'd get a few Republican co-sponsors, and I didn't, didn't get either. And the bill was intended, it was a Civil Rights Act of 2019, and it was meant to ban racial profiling in New Hampshire, it was meant to deal with overcharging and oversentencing of people of color or people by race. Uh, we know that Irish, Greeks, uh, Italians, Eastern Europeans, and Jews are still sometimes targeted um, by government, government agencies and government officials. Um, and people are sometimes targeted by their race, even if they're not black, um, or targeted by religion, religious minorities. Um, that people in the LGBT community have said that they've been, they've been targeted by prosecutors and people just kind of fighting a war in their own minds. Mm -hmm. So I introduced this bill, House Bill 732, the New Hampshire Civil Rights Act of 2019, and put a lot of time and effort into it and worked with a lot of people and contacted a lot of groups. And it was surprising how little interest and enthusiasm there was. So the, the bill, rather than pass it, they just kind of tabled it and let it die on the table, mm -hmm. the Democrat controlled house. Um, fast forward to 2020 and you have the killing of George Floyd, the killing of Breonna Ta Taylor, who was just a complete bystander. And by the way, her, um, I believe it was her uh, boyfriend or husband who was in the bed uh, was woken up and he was shot and killed also. Um, police officers, um, including police officers of color have been killed in the riots. Children have been killed in the riots um, and people have been killed in SWAT raids, 80,000 SWAT raids into people's homes, 79% of which are motivated by nonviolent drug uh, enforcement. And 65% of those, two thirds of those don't turn up anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and many of those, many of those killings, the hundreds and hundreds of people, Americans who've been killed in SWAT raids, uh, they've had their constitutional rights violated. And frequently we find out that the police department or someone in the police department wrote down the wrong address. They entered the wrong home. 
that drug dealers know that they're likely to get raided at any point and they already have a plan for if they get raided at two o'clock in the morning but ordinary people aren't expecting to become the victim of one of these SWAT raids. And so that's why a lot of the needless deaths, injuries, animals have been killed. Uh, recently, a nine-year-old girl was shot in the leg, but because she was a white girl, that didn't match the media's narrative. And so it got carried on social media. People saw how carelessly the cop shot at a dog and ended up hitting a, a nine-year-old girl. Um, it didn't match the media's narrative. So it, it didn't get a lot of news coverage. Uh, also, there was a recently there was a white man where they kneeled on the man's neck until he died, and there was no news coverage on that. There was no news coverage on a, a black woman police officer who was fired in Buffalo uh, for telling other another officer not to kneel on the neck of a man, uh, and she may have saved his life, but she lost her pension one year before she qualified for a pension. So if something doesn't match the media's narrative, the media doesn't cover it. So I don't think that we can trust the media to provide objective news coverage on this issue. I think all we can do as elected officials, as legislators at least, is pass legislation like this that's designed to stop uh, further abuse by, well, public housing, public schools, public colleges, but most importantly, our criminal justice system. Would you, along those lines, would you be in favor of eliminating or or somehow putting restrictions on on so-called no-knock warrants and and other kinds of civil forfeitures and, and things like that yes and as a matter of fact we've been uh uh working to put an end to qualified immunity mm -hmm. uh, to put an end to no-knock raids those are obviously illegal and unconstitutional and should never be allowed um, we were originally told in the 19, was it late 1960s, Lyndon Johnson, when they started the war on drugs and war on crime, where they started the RICO statutes and they started going after uh, people. They said they were going to go only go after gangs and organized crime. And the vast, vast majority of these raids, no knock raids, and the vast majority of SWAT teams kicking down people's doors, 80,000 SWAT raids into people's homes every year. It's mostly when you when you look at these cases where people are getting injured or killed or dragged out in the street at three o'clock in the morning, just ordinary middle class suburban neighborhoods and people with no ties to street gangs or anything else. The vast majority of, of victims of these kinds of raids are just ordinary people who don't have any involvement with uh, organized criminal activity of any kind. Sure. And as you know, uh, there's a lot of a lot of people who end up in the criminal justice system that arrested for possession or selling marijuana and other kinds of, of um, victimless drugs. Would you support decriminalization of marijuana and changing the banking laws to allow the states that have legalized um, marijuana and cannabis um, sales through dispensaries and elsewhere uh, to change the banking laws to allow those businesses to operate legally? I support re-legalization of personal use of marijuana. And the reason is that I've been working on medical marijuana issues over the years. And we found, you know, one symptom, um, one illness after another, after another, Crohn's disease, seizures, uh, cancer patients, HIV patients, people needing to hold down their medication. We're finding more and more and more illnesses. <clears throat> Actually, I think one of the most recent is heroin addiction. I, I just spoke with a heroin addict um, late last year who, because of, uh, how do you put this? He tried everything. He'd been through heroin treatment multiple times. Mm -hmm. And he finally left, uh, finally got off of uh, heroin because he switched to marijuana. Um, I think um, maybe it was Slash or one of the other members of Guns N' Roses said that they, they needed to use marijuana in order to get off of drugs. There have been mm -hmm. a lot of long-time drug users, cocaine, heroin, uh, those are really, really dangerous drugs. Even prescription drugs are killing thousands of people every year, the abuse of prescription drugs. And a lot of people are getting off of these things only because of uh, use of marijuana, medical use of marijuana. But it's just very difficult. Every time we try to introduce a bill, it can take two, three, four years to get a new treatment, a new medical condition mm -hmm. uh, uh dealt with that way and it's difficult for people to get a mar medical marijuana id card and we had to fight with governor maggie hassan for a, a good couple of years 
to get her, now she's a U.S. senator, to get her to have DHHS issue these medical marijuana cards. So um, at this point, I think that the only thing we can do is, is just re-legalize marijuana. I think we've seen that marijuana prohibition, alcohol prohibition, gun prohibition, drug prohibition, gambling prohibition, all they've done, these are unenforceable laws. Every time they've stepped up enforcement of these laws, crime has gone up. And when they finally uh, repealed some of these victimless crimes, crime has gone down. Uh, every time they've relaxed gun prohibition, alcohol prohibition, marijuana prohibition, whether it was at the state or national level. Sure. Speaking of crime and also tying back into the topic of violence against black Americans and minorities, but, but also civil rights of, of all Americans, there's been a couple of issues, one of which is the issue of defunding police departments. And then, of course, there's the other issue of the militarization of the police. As you know, uh, the military certainly sells uh, used hardware, older hardware, military-grade hardware to police departments all across the country. If elected president, would you support and allow localities to determine how they conduct their policing? And would you also prevent the Department of Defense from selling military-grade hardware to police departments? I think that President Reagan put it best that the federal government's only involvement in local matters is just to protect your civil liberties, which is something that you you do through the courts if you uh, feel that you've been wronged. A lot of people are wronged by uh, state and local. Um, I've been speaking uh, not just in the legislature, but in public and, and, and doing public speeches against further militariz militarization of police departments. Mm -hmm. the, so the union leader after not just me, but a lot of other people in, in, in New Hampshire have been speaking out. Um, they put a poll up asking the general public, do you think that your town should have a Bearcat or an armored personnel carrier or, or mm -hmm. some other military hardware? 90% said no, but because you have these police chiefs who want it to have it as kind of part of their overall, you know, under the penumbra of their jurisdiction, they want to have more boats, more, Humvees, more APCs, more Bearcats, more equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, they just keep accepting all this free equipment. Of course, this free equipment comes in with strings attached mm -hmm. where the federal government um, in giving all this military hardware to the states, for example, state national, national guards in the 1990s, uh, one of the strings attached was, okay, now you have to allow the federal government to deploy your state national guard units out to, mm -hmm. to foreign wars. And sure enough, in the Middle East, we have a lot of National Guardsmen, people who signed up for domestic service. And uh, because of the mil because the federal government's been militarizing National Guard and militarizing uh, local police departments, uh, they're deployed overseas. And the, the cost of maintenance and fuel on some of this equipment is absolutely outrageous. And it's putting a lot of pressure on small towns when they accept, uh, I think Seabrooks accepted three free boats. Uh, one we've never seen ever, two we've never seen ever, one, they've spent over $80,000 on maintenance getting this boat up and ready. And I don't think it's ever been used once, not successfully. Um, they've taken bulletproof and bullet resistant equipment and they say, well, if we ever have a shootout, but they've never actually used it for any of the purposes that they say that they, they need it for. So um, I do support dash cams and body cams. I co-sponsored a bill for for body cams and I put a citizen's petition on the ballot in my town for for dash cams for the police. Uh, police department, uh, the police chief and some of his buddies showed up and zeroed it out so the voters didn't even get to vote on it. And shortly thereafter, the, um, the infamous uh, Seabrook police station beating where they throw the guy's head into the wall and throw him on the ground and laugh at him as they pepper spray him. Uh, that was seen by millions of people all over the country Mm -hmm. um, on YouTube and on on uh, on media and on networks, and that's one of the things that Seabrook has become famous for. What people don't realize is, and and people said this in the comment section, mm -hmm. Seabrook Police Department's beaten up hundreds of people over the years. This is just they've got a whole box of videotapes where they've done mm -hmm. bad things to people, and those videos have not gotten out. They're just kind of squirreled away in the police station, and the police department knows about it. Sure. And the only thing that that kind of exposes that if is if you have uh, dash cams and body cams uh, exposing police corruption and, and, and being used to get rid of bad cops. A, a couple more questions about criminal justice reform. A couple of the delegates over the last few debates have asked about for-profit prisons. 
Um, do you support continuing the existing prison system? Would you support reforms? Um, what, what's your position on for-profit prisons? Um, well, we fought and defeated prison privatization. It actually wasn't privatization. It was contracting out. Contracting out is different. Obviously, you're not going to you're not going to buy, you know, prison as an individual as a service for yourself. Uh, privatization means that you keep your own money. We cut taxes, and then you keep your own money, and then buy insurance or bus service or water service or something else privately from somebody you know and trust. Um, and we do that with we do that with most services in this country. Seventy to eighty percent of things are still done. At, uh, through the private sector. And I think that the private sector does a pretty good job of things, but contracting out prison, um, I don't think that's a good idea because it creates, um, it would have created a powerful, an even more powerful prison lobby. We already have the prosecutors, the police chiefs association, the corrections unions, um, and strangely the beer lobby. Every time we try to repeal a law or end mandatory minimums, it's a lot of work trying to get that done. Um, criminal justice reform, we always encounter enormous, enormous resistance, even though there might be 90 to 99% public support for something. In, in fact, I put in a bill that would have simply said that prosecutors could no longer file criminal charges against people where they knew the person they're prosecuting is actually innocent. Mm -hmm. And of course, 100% public support. What does the attorney general's office do? They send one of their guys, uh, they sent one of their guys uh, from the, eight, they sent two of their people from the attorney general's office. One of them testified and they were finally asked point blank because they wouldn't give a direct answer. Uh, have you ever targeted anyone you know to be innocent? And the, the, the prosecutor from the AG's office kind of weaseled around it. <laughs> and then they asked another question. Have, do you know of any other prosecutor in the attorney general's office? who's uh, targeted people where they knew that they were innocent. And then she just went totally sideways and wouldn't answer the question at all. So it was obvious. Uh, it was obvious right from the beginning um, that they knew that they were targeting people they knew were innocent. We've seen cases like the Chad Evans case where it was, it was, it was, he's in prison right now for life. And the only evidence they had uh, that he'd murdered, murdered this two-year-old was from the real murderer, the, the babysitter who was the last person to see him alive. And this babysitter uh, now has, he's a big uh, burly guy mm -hmm. who has restraining orders now from every other girlfriend he's ever been with and broken up with. Um, so you have this, the, the real killer has a long, long history of, uh, of violence and you have all of these people, you have almost a third of the prison population maintain their innocence or accept responsibility for a lesser charge. I had a bill in for evidence preservation where people maintain their innocence, just saying that the state shouldn't be allowed to destroy the evidence. Um, and we keep developing new and better, um, new and better methods for examining forensic evidence. And all we need to do is preserve you know, evidence that's no long, no uh, larger than this uh, peso. Sure. And uh, and the state just insists on destroying evidence whenever they can to cover up for uh, their wrongful prosecutions. Sure. Let me ask you one last question about criminal justice reform, because uh, this just came in from from one of the delegates. Uh, would you support the idea of an independent prosecutor to step in in cases where um, law enforcement or law enforcement officers are accused of, of wrongdoing? Yes, in fact, in 2016, I was the uh, the only third party gubernatorial candidate in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. um, and I ran in part on a platform of bringing in an independent inspector or an uh, independent prosecutor um, who would have the power to go after government officials who are currently being, you know, covered for by this whole good old boy network that they have. Mm -hmm. But it, they need to go after not just cases where it, it, it's police accused of wrongdoing. Um, anyone in the state, anyone working for government should be investigated on the outside, totally separate from it. And I suggested that uh, that the House of Representatives appoint three individuals to go and uh, investigate criminal wrongdoing by government officials. Sure. Uh, let's switch gears very briefly to the other top topic of 2020, which is obviously the COVID-19 pandemic. I um, thought you were going to say the murder hornets. 
<laughs> I, had somebody, I had somebody just that's, go after that's me. That's the third top story. <laughs> I said, yeah, we should do something about the murder hornets. And he's like, what do you think the state's going to do to stop the murder hornets from coming in? That's right. Well, we, we'll get to that if, if we have time. We'll make we'll table that for our, our number three top topic. Laser. But the, but the, uh, but the COVID-19 pandemic, um, many of us were well aware of what was happening in China in late December and early January. We were seeing stories come in. Uh, China is not a small economy, obviously. It's not a small country. It's a country of over 1 billion people, one of the largest economies in the world. Uh, we were seeing stories all throughout January about ships being held out of port, uh, manufacturing shutting down, pollution levels dropping. This was an economy, this first or second largest world economy, uh, that was basically shutting down to deal with this pandemic. And yet neither the Democratic nor Republican Party candidates uh, for president or any member of the House or Senate, I think with the exception of one or two, um, really took the issue very seriously. Now we're in the midst of a major economic collapse, uh, 40 million people unemployed. How would you, if you were elected president, cope with the pandemic, which seems to be ongoing, and the economic effects that are coming with that? Uh, from the beginning, actually, I shouldn't say this, not from the beginning, um, about about two weeks into the lockdown, I, I was looking at what was working, what wasn't, what's counterproductive. And since then, I've been saying uh, for the last two months, do the five, not the lockdown. In other words, the five are of course, social distancing, wash your hands. Um, if you have symptoms, stay home. If you're in a high risk category, stay home. Um, right. Those five things have, you know, maintain six feet apart from people, cough and sneeze into your elbow. And I... I think that those have proven to be effective, but I think that the lockdown is counterproductive. I ask people the question this way. I, I say, you're, you're, you're taking all these people, all these shoppers, and you're channeling them. You've shut down all the small business businesses in, uh, in town, and you're just you're funneling everyone into a handful of big box stores and grocery stores. And right. do you think that this is actually cutting down on, on, the, on the spread? That's increasing the spread. If anything else, um, David uh, Collison asked about the Sweden model. Uh, Sweden and South Korea decided to go for uh, testing rather than uh, testing and, of course, do the five. Mm -hmm. And they didn't shut much down. I think they shut down rail systems and a couple of other things. And they overcame sure. the coronavirus almost immediately because they were able to stop the spread but keep the economy going. Uh, we wouldn't need the additional $2 trillion in bailouts, about $625 billion of that. Mm -hmm. uh, is subsidies to the airlines and big business and oil companies and big banks. And I think that a lot of public trust was lost with the $1.5 trillion in bailouts during the Great Recession, which was uh, both Republicans and not all of them, most Republicans and most Democrats voted for one of those two bailouts. Uh, and some of them voted for both the bailouts. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I would say uh, do the five, not the lockdown. Don't shut down the economy. Shutting down the economy is clearly proven to be counterproductive. I think that we need to get a better handle on what these these viruses and outbreaks are early on mm -hmm. and not, uh, not uh, jump to conclusions and just shut things down. It's one thing to shut things down for, for you know, two or three or four days, but to shut everything down for for two months while they sit there having all their bureaucratic meetings uh, I, I think that that was embarrassing. I will say this, uh, there's a, unspoken, there's a there's generally accepted rule in the Republican Party that you never, ever, ever vote for anything or do anything that will cost people their jobs. And I'd like to say that that's because, you know, they're putting the country's interest first, but actually I think it's it's probably just as much political and it's very it's a very easy, cheap selling point to say we never cost anyone their jobs. Um, and most private sector workers vote Republican, at least in part, I mean, to, to be blunt, mm -hmm. to, uh, to protect their jobs, logging, trucking, farmers, fishermen, um, people whose jobs are being harmed by some of the Democrat Party's policies. The Republican Party has, I, I think they've come together and they've met and they've said, OK, well, we're going to you know, protect all these manufacturing and energy jobs in, in part for political reasons. Sure. But here in the, in the, in the lockdown, I think uh, 
some of the Republican governors like Charlie Baker down in Massachusetts have been almost as bad as the Democrat governors. You know, they're, they're, they're breaking their own rule. And I think they're going to, I think they're going to suffer for it in uh, November. Sure. One of the biggest issues that's come out uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic has been the collapse of a lot of government uh, technology. We've seen in states all across the country, unemployment websites crashing, people unable to file claims and request services. A lot of it is because systems have been antiquated and, and not updated for decades. Uh, another aspect of it, for example, the IRS, when they had to issue um, stimulus checks to people in social security who don't pay taxes, uh, they actually spent three weeks to build out an entirely new simple, uh, simple file system and then realized that they could just use the Social Security Administration system to do direct deposits. Uh, there seems to be a tremendous technological disconnect in government today. Um, what would you do to modernize and di uh, digitization of government to improve the overall service delivery across uh, both, uh, well, across the federal government, but also to provide state government's resources to do the same? Actually, um, I don't think, I've always asked this question, why should government take your money from you and then make you fill out a lot of forms and jump through a lot of bureaucratic hoops to try to get some of your own money back? Um, there are, uh, what, I, what I proposed in my campaign is called the 007 plan, which would essentially say, we're not gonna do that anymore. We're not gonna have the federal government take your money and make you go to the unemployment office and the welfare office and federal job training programs, which are no notoriously wasteful um, what we, what I would do is get back to something like what we had under Eisenhower and John F. Kennedy, which is a very, very small constitutionally limited federal government. We had a very small constitutionally limited government for 200 years. And as, as part of this, this compromise of keeping government very, very small, um, most middle class households paid little or no income taxes or payroll taxes. So your paycheck would be under my plan, the 007 plan, 30 to 40 percent larger. So you, you, you take the average worker who's making, uh, you know, $350 a week when they actually look at their pay stub, when they look at their paycheck after all is said and done, they don't have $250 a week. So in theory, you're supposed to get unemployment and welfare and tax credits and subsidies and loan guarantees and, and all this myriad bureaucracy and programs. Under the 007 plan, you wouldn't get any of those things, but you'd still have the $350 a week in your paycheck. So your, your paycheck would be substantially larger. Uh, the other, th ooh, that's a good one. So a flat tax with a universal rebate, uh, kind of. <laughs> uh, that's actually that's actually a good question. It's uh, it's uh, if you remember Gary Johnson's fair tax plan. Mm -hmm. It, economists have been discussing which is better, a flat tax, like a compensation tax or a consumption tax. Mm -hmm. So all, all the money that you make, you earn it once and then you spend it once. Spend, save, invest, donate. Mm -hmm. um, donate to charities, give to family, what have you. Um, so it, it turns out there's a rule of economics that the lower the tax rate you can get, the better your compliance, the fewer people are going to try and weasel out of it and, and spend money overseas and put money to foreign tax shelters and and, mm -hmm. you know, what, what came out in 2016, both Bill Clinton and Hillary, both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump had a little tax shelter in Delaware and they were using the same same post office uh, company and had all their mail go through there. And they had dummy corporations there so they could avoid all kinds of state level taxes. And and they both had hundreds of millions of dollars and they they were paying eight or nine percent. And some of these uh, rich Hollywood uh, types, New York billionaires are, are paying almost nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it, it's a scandal. Uh, well, it turns out the most efficient tax system that you can have, if you want the lowest rates that you can have and still raise the roughly four trillion in revenue, is actually to break it up. Um, and you can get by instead of say a 23% uh, fair tax or a 28% income tax, you can actually get something even lower. And what I would do is I would take about uh, these 110 different hidden taxes, gas taxes, utility taxes, travel taxes, hotel taxes, hidden business taxes, adds up to about 8% of, you know, consumer costs are about 8% higher. Mm -hmm. All these hidden taxes that you pay, I would replace that with just an 8% fair tax. So all the, all the new goods and services that you buy, you just pay the 
Mm -hmm. uh, so most of your goods and services, unless you're buying an imported car or some imported items, they're going to cost about the same. Um, imported items would cost about three to five percent more. Uh, but employers also pay about 13 percent in hidden payroll taxes, unemployment taxes, federal unemployment, and a few other uh, items. Uh, so I'd replace that with a flat 13% compensation tax. So your, your, your total federal tax burden is 21%, but you still get the $7,000 per year per person put into your health savings account. Um, so the net result is uh, individuals making less than you know, 50,000 a year would pay effectively nothing. And a family of four making less than I think 120,000 a year would pay nothing. So when you, when you add it all up, the, your, your rebates are as large or larger than what your total tax bill is. Right. So the, the benefit there is, is, like I say, a bird in hand is worth two in the bush. Right. Uh, the 007 plan, I think, is more efficient um, because I think if you escape the ideological arguments, mm -hmm. uh, why should I pay for this? Why should I pay for that? If the only thing you're getting is the $7,000 a year per person in rebates put into your health savings account, you mm -hmm. control the money. And then you can cover routine medical, dental, educational costs, pay off student loans, paid family leave, paid medical leave, paid sick leave. You kind of have that money. Your family has that money to, to fall back on. A family of four would be getting $28,000 a year per person put into their health savings account to cover college costs, community college, trade school, technical school, uh, sure. whatever you needed to do. And it since it's the same for everyone, there's not, uh, you know, you don't need a big gigantic federal bureaucracy to maintain it. Sure. Uh, you spoke about schooling and, and trade school. Let's talk a little bit about education and, and then we'll jump into another topic in a second. Um, we've recently seen the vice president and, of course, we know candidates like Senator Warren and, and Bernie Sanders have, have advocated for eliminating student debt. Uh, just the government basically re, uh, reimbursing, I guess, a lot of students who have student debt and then also offering free public education for two-year college or four-year college degrees, depending upon the different plans that are out there. Um, what do you see as far as for higher education, uh, what would your plan be? Do you support those initiatives or do you have an alternative view? Well, one of the inside jokes in uh, Concord is the whole free college scam. I was going to college at the same time that I'm a state legislator and I'm going to the, I'm at the state house as a legislator and we're all laughing about the free college scam. Democrats always go to colleges and they say, you know, socialism means free stuff. You're going to get free college. And we're like, it's nothing free. They're just going to make you pay for it through taxes. And if you actually look at the total cost of college mm -hmm. um, in states with Democrat legislatures where they have these enormous subsidies, cost of college is actually higher. The higher the subsidy, the, the, the worse it is. And the same is true about, about the, uh, the federal level, where the more the federal government subsidizes colleges and universities, the more they just respond and increase uh, cost. When I was attending a Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in mm -hmm. upstate New York, um, I think uh, Bill Clinton signed a deal where they increased some technical scholarship by $250 a year. And they had me go down to the bursar's office and sign something, signing away $250 away of, of college aid. So basically, I had to sign something saying I'm losing it all and the college got all the money. And every time we see that, in fact, the Republicans did the same thing in uh, the 1990s. They were warned against it and they did it anyway. Mm -hmm. And they increased financial aid. And the only thing that happened is the students weren't helped. Um, overall aid packages increased by, I think, $5,000. Mm -hmm. And colleges increased their cost by $5,000 over the same four-year period. And the students got nothing but, you know, more debt. So it, it, it doesn't it really doesn't help. Um, I do believe that we should lower the interest rates on student loans. I would lower them to the fair market rate. Mm -hmm. um, I would have student loans be income to contingent uh, when you come out of college uh, by default. Um, and I would also um, increase things like ROTC scholarships, National Guard scholarships and STEM scholarships. But that's mostly for uh, filling the increased demand for engineering, architecture, uh, medical, medical specialists, things that uh, that we're definitely going to have a need from. We've had uh, 90,000 doctors retire early under Obamacare, and we mm -hmm. were warned as legislators, we were warned that if we kept Obamacare going, with all the mandates that were put on, that another 90,000 doctors were going to retire early because they couldn't make any money under the Obamacare plan. All the economic pressure and the 
the reductions in Medicare benefits, um, reductions in Medicare payouts for doctor's visits uh, fell on doctors and uh, and it was a it was of course a disaster, I think, uh, for government interference. I think we should just get government out of health care. Well, uh, yeah, let, let's switch to, to health care because that's another area in which the, uh, the Republicans have been a little bit more quiet about a, a really deep set of proposals for health care reform. I know that for many years they talked about repeal and replace Obamacare. They won the election in 2016, um, had a few months to prepare for when the transition took place, and then didn't really have much of a plan. The Democrats have been really on board as far as unifying around Medicare for all, a few different proposals, whether it's Bernie Sanders or Senator Warren. Um, what would you support as far as health care reform in this country? Uh, I think that we should just get government out of health care. Uh, back, again, back in the 1950s and 60s, under Eisenhower and John F. Kennedy, for all those years that we stuck with constitutionally limited government, healthcare costs stable at about 5% of GDP for a very, very, very long time. And all through that time, we had, at least certainly during the 50s and 60s, um, pretty much every employer in the country provided uh, health insurance for their employees. So we literally had, people didn't know what a copay was. Uh, you had, you just, you know, showed up with your health card Mm -hmm. and said, here's my plan and it's current. And we had virtually, in most of the country, universal health care free at the point of service. But we had it through a free market system. And in fact, um, Singapore, Germany, Switzerland, Japan has 5,000 different private insurance companies. Japan mm -hmm. spends about half what we spend. Germany spends half what we spend. And they have world class results. Mm -hmm. uh, Hong Kong still spends about 5.2% of GDP. They get world-class results. Singapore spends just 4% of GDP. They have mm -hmm. a little bit, they have a little bit of government involvement in healthcare, but a lot less than what we have. Most of what they have in Singapore is their health savings account system. Mm -hmm. They have a kind of subsidy for the elderly, and but it, it's it's pretty modest. And they also have a scholarship program uh, to provide college for anyone who's uh, comes from a low income background if you want free college you you just go to medical school you're sure. great and all you have to do is keep your grades up and uh, that's how they keep a proper supply of uh, doctors nurses and technicians um, and that that works they spend only four percent of GDP on health care and they've got the highest uh, living standards in the world mm -hmm. great uh, we're about uh, 15 minutes before the hour, we still have, we have still a bit of time, but we do have a lot of topics still to get to. I, I know there's a few more questions about healthcare, but let's switch gears briefly to foreign policy, um, just to change things up a little bit. I wonder if uh, I can take this uh, question: um, sure. government involvement is making healthcare more expensive. Sure, go uh, ahead. The average has 42 different insurance mandates. It adds about 20 to 25 percent to your healthcare costs. It ranges from 17 to 57. Rhode Island's the worst with 57 insurance mandates. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, Obamacare dramatically increased uh, administrative costs. Doctors' offices and clinics said they saw their administrative costs go from about 10% of revenue to 40% of revenue. Mm -hmm. um, subsidies, the FDA's 10 to 18 year long approval process. I don't think any Western country even has a two year long approval process. Um, we repealed certificate of need at the state level. That of course is just pure cronyism. That's hospitals uh, blocking competition in the healthcare marketplace. If you wanted a cardiac procedure of some kind, uh, hospitals are using certificate of need to use the state to block competition anywhere near that uh, hospital and so forth. There's there's a lot of government interference. There's patent abuse by big pharma, uh, all kinds of hidden taxes that you don't see, lots and lots of subsidies, subsidizing hospital wing construction leading to outrageous uh, um, hospital bed vacancy rates, something like 35% nationwide. Uh, I, I, probably go on all day with government interference in healthcare licensing regulation red tape yeah uh, well let's 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 do switch gears i know there are a few other questions but let's switch gears to foreign policy um, we've seen american foreign policy be the source of a lot of problems over the last uh, the last uh, few decades um, when you look back at the obama administration and then of course recently the trump administration and you can even go back as far as as bush and and clinton if you want um, when you look at these for these administrations, how would you approach foreign policy decision making differently? What do you see as sort of the major failings of American foreign policy over the last few decades, and, and what would you do differently? 
again, for 200 years, except for uh, the Cold War, dealing with uh, Soviet military expansion. We basically uh, minded our own business and offered uh, commerce, diplomacy, uh, foreign international investment. Um, there, there were a few occasions under McKinley and a few other presidents where uh, the U.S. military was sent out to um, kind of have the U.S. government force its way on Hawaii. Hawaii used to be an independent country. Um, Panama, I believe, was either seized or, or was it taken under a particular deal? Um, but the locals didn't have any say in that. There have been a lot of countries in South America and Central America that uh, U.S. government interference um, caused uh, unintended problems. But I, I, I think overall we had a non-interventionist foreign policy, starting with uh, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson warning uh, the country to avoid foreign entanglements, not to get tied into other countries' affairs and alliances mm -hmm. and deals. I, I think that we really need to get back. We need to bring the troops home from the Middle, Middle East. Um, I don't oppose uh, all foreign deployments. There are some instances where, uh, you know, a stitch in time saves nine, where uh, our military experts have said that just having a few thousand troops present in some trouble spots uh, might prevent uh, uh, something from boiling over into a hot war. Right. Um, however, uh, I, I really believe that we need to just stick with commerce and diplomacy, that that's that's really where we lead technological prowess. That's where we lead the world. That's our strong point. Uh, we're, we're just not, we haven't been as a country good at occupying and controlling foreign countries and uh, UN style nation building, I think is, has been a disaster. Um, sure. And that, again, that's, that's bipartisan. It did kind of start, it did kind of boil over under Clinton, but it's been under Bush, Trump, Obama, uh, Republican regime, Republican president after Democrat president after Republican after Democrat. I think it's, I, I think that most Americans have said they've seen enough. Sure. With respect to China in particular, as we know, China has been in the news, um, particularly with some of the revelations that have come out from uh, former National Security Advisor John Bolton and talking about the president trying to um, leverage the relationship with China for his own election. Um, the trade policies that he's implemented and some of the negative impacts that those have had. Uh, the relationship with China has certainly become a more difficult one over the years. We've seen Chinese military expansion throughout the islands. We've seen a lot of uh, aggressive um, activities towards the Philippines, towards Japan, and, and towards other traditional U.S. allies. Would you support increased naval presence in the Pacific to counter the Chinese threat, or do you prefer a different approach for engaging with China? If our military leaders uh, call for it, I would uh, I would uh, deploy uh, carrier task forces as was done in the 1990s. Um, I think that a, a, sometimes a show of military forces is necessary, but but my my preference is to stay out of the region as much as possible. Uh, the real strength that China has uh, over the U.S. is that we're $26 trillion in debt. More than $1 trillion of that is held by the Chinese government itself. And, of course, Chinese investors also hold uh, quite a bit more beyond that. Uh, mm -hmm. To balance the budget is, is really about the need to free ourselves from foreign control. A tremendous amount of the national debt, I believe, about a trillion dollars is held by Japan. Roughly mm -hmm. a trillion is held by each Saudi Arabia and uh, what is it, Dubai? Mm -hmm. um, the Europeans own hundreds of billions of dollars of our debt. Uh, if you if you include Britain, um, even the Canadians own a large portion of our debt. So all these foreign countries are able to influence Congress. Members of Congress want to get reelected. So sure. what do they do? They, they, they go back to their districts and they spend over $60 billion a year on pork barrel projects in their district, um, which means more debt. They spend more and more money on government handouts and giveaways. And the only way that we're going to free ourselves from international control by foreign governments and multinational corporations and foreign banks is by balancing the budget and starting to pay down the national debt so that uh, we don't have our domestic policies controlled by uh, foreign regimes. Uh, the next foreign policy topic would be North Korea. As we know, the president came under a lot of criticism for his outreach to Kim Jong-un. 
Um, it initially seemed like it had some some positive impacts. The the amount of nuclear tests stopped. The um, missile tests stopped. But it seems as if most of that goodwill has eroded or completely been negated at this point. Do you believe that there's any way that North Korea can be successfully engaged, or do you think that it's just better to maintain a policy of containment and and keep uh, our our presence in in the neutral zone and, and with South Korea? Well, we, yes, I think that uh, I think that there's potential there for again commerce and diplomacy uh, and uh, foreign investment, international investment can work. It worked with Vietnam, which we thought was a lost cause. It's, it's, it, it could work. It seems that it could be working with Cuba. Uh, Iran in the 1980s was, a, in the 1970s was a, one of our, our toughest adversaries. And the Ronald Reagan believed for a time that he could work with Iranian moderates um, to change politics within Iran. Mm -hmm. to accept foreign investment. I think that that, that that did pay off with some dividends. The Iranians became less hostile to us and they have worked with us on a number of occasions, for example, with uh, putting a stop to the uh, development of uh, depleted uranium mm -hmm. in, uh, in their uranium development program. Uh, I think that cooperating with other countries shows a lot of promise and I, I think that it, it is very disarming in a sense, when you when you engage these other countries and and you're you're kind of holding out the carrot and the stick, when they see the carrot, they tend to forget about the stick. And uh, when there's you know potentially billions of dollars in uh, foreign investment uh, lingering offshore, if you uh, if you cooperate with the international community, I, I think that more and more countries will will kind of follow that path and work cooperatively with the rest of the world. Sure. You talked about bringing troops home and, and having a different uh, kind of military posture. Um, currently, we have uh, a continued involvement in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which was originally created to block the Soviet threat in the Warsaw Pact. But over the last uh, decade or so, NATO has been used for everything from military operations in North Africa to the Middle East. Um, do you believe that there is still a military mission and purpose for NATO? Do you believe that U.S. troops should come home from Europe uh, or that NATO should be changed in some way or eliminated? I think that NATO's purpose needs to be retasked to a humanitarian mission. There are, on very, very rare occasion, now that the Soviet empire is gone or that it's, it's been reduced to uh, Russia, which is, is now a much bigger player on the economic sphere, in the mm -hmm. sphere of uh, international investment, they do, they do sell quite a bit of military hardware mm -hmm. to uh, to uh, countries in uh, Asia and Africa and in uh, Europe. Um, I, I think that uh, NATO does have a mission, but it does need to, to change radically for the 21st century. I think that, that we should be the good guys in foreign affairs, that we, should, that we should lead with diplomacy and humanitarian missions to provide aid, uh, dropping food and military supplies where, where they can do some benefit. Uh, and that uh, those boxes should say made in America. If you remember in the wor World War II, uh, we shipped a lot of material to uh, to uh, Stalinist Russia and Stalin took all the American flags out off, took all the provisions out, put them into Russian boxes and and for for a time until Truman, no Franklin Roosevelt made him stop and and uh, notify his troops that this is uh, American support. Um, he was telling the people that 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 uh, Stalin himself had come up with this somehow magically. Sure. You know, there's no possible way that you can have American food produced in uh, Soviet Union at the time. But when the instructions were coming over in, in English, I think it, it must have been obvious to some of the Russian soldiers. But you, you win friends and influence enemies by, by, by offering the carrot, not by uh, continuous bombings and foreign occupations. Sure. Uh, a lot of the issues with, uh, with, countries like Russia and, and China, uh, to a lesser extent, Iran, North Korea, and even countries like Brazil has been the growing threat of cyber warfare and cyber attacks, not just against the U.S. government, but also against um, major industries and infrastructure. Uh, do you believe that the United States needs to shift away from conventional warfare and investing in conventional warfare and focus more on increasing our ability to defend against cyber attacks? I think that we need 
I wouldn't uh, abandon uh, conventional military capabilities that, that we do need to maintain our ability to project power to uh, two different fronts at the same time, mm -hmm. which was uh, the strategy developed at the end of the Cold War when we saw that the Soviet Empire was collapsing mm -hmm. and there was no longer going to be likely to be a large invasion by Soviet tanks into Europe. And now the, the concern was the occasional Saddam Hussein, the occasional North Korean regime, the occasional threat. We might be engaged in a war like the Persian Gulf War, first or second Persian Gulf War, and that you might have uh, some dictator or warlord somewhere, or, or even pirates in uh, this, you know, near the Suez Canal. I was on a merchant ship. We were almost boarded by pirates coming out of the Suez Canal. And I came up, I came up on watch to the bridge and the captain was up there and he was panicking. The chief mate was up there panicking. And I think the uh, second mate was coming up there and they were all jittery and they and they, they were like arguing whether or not to shine a, a spotlight on this. It turned out we went right past three pirate vessels. They all had their lights off and we caught them sleeping. Whoever was uh, on watch and supposed to be watching out for American uh, or foreign merchant ships coming in so they could board those ships uh, must've been asleep at the time because they missed us. But uh, that was one of one of uh, memories of uh, close calls coming out of the Suez Canal. Uh, sure. We need to maintain two mission capability, but I don't believe that we need to. Uh, it, it should be like nine one one. It it's something that you use only a, as a method of last resort. But but uh, uh, I would invest in qu development of quantum computing and mm -hmm. uh, continue the development of uh, supercomputing funding. Um, to crack some of the codes and encryption that uh, some of our adversaries are using. Sure. Uh, let's bring the foreign policy topics a little bit closer to home into the Western Hemisphere. Uh, Venezuela, as you know, during the Chavez administration was doing a lot of work supporting the drug trafficking in, in Marxist organization FARC in Colombia. And then with the transition to the Madero government, um, a lot of the Obama administration started to implement more and more sanctions, targeted sanctions. But the impact of what's gone on has been a virtual and total collapse of the Venezuelan economy. Um, now we have images of, of people literally running down the street, chasing after garbage trucks just to rummage in the back to find food. We have over a million, million and a half Venezuelans who have fled out of the country into neighboring Colombia and to Peru and to Chile, as well as up north into the United States. Uh, do you believe that economic sanctions at this point have become counterproductive? Would you change the U.S. policy towards Venezuela? Uh, yes, I would. I don't believe that sanctions have, have worked. Uh, we started this under Thomas Jefferson mm -hmm. in 18, what was it, 1803, maybe? It, right, it was, it was one of the first things that he did. He didn't want to engage in a war, in a mm -hmm. hot war, um, due to the... Uh, the uh, Shanghaiing of American sailors. He didn't want to uh, just sit back and do nothing. He didn't think that continued uh, uh, communiques with uh, Great Britain were helping. So mm -hmm. he decided to come up with sanctions. And I think we saw that sanctions didn't work then. And 200 and 217 years of attempting sanctions, they've, they've, they've never been successful. They haven't been successful with Cuba. Uh, the regimes remain in power and the, the people starve. Uh, I think that the best thing that we could do for Venezuela is open up trade, uh, again, trade, commerce, diplomacy, foreign investment, and information, uh, tie uh, complete open access to the uh, the internet, social media, forums, information news, foreign news, um, and open up uh, Venezuela. And I think that uh, the people in Venezuela, if they have free free flow of information, can can figure out what they need to do in their own country to to bring about political reforms. And, and you mentioned Cuba, that would be another topic too. And, and in the case of the embargo, since it's been going on for, for so long, would you favor a policy of simply ending the embargo completely, replacing it with nothing, no incoming tax, no outgoing tax, just as a way to help revitalize the Cuban economy or would you prefer a different approach? Um, I think I'd like to tie it to the free flow of information. It may be possible through some type of Wi-Fi system to open up, uh, open up the Cuban economy and population to uh, some system of of uh, Wi-Fi and, and and internet access, um, where regimes like regimes like Cuba, uh, North Korea, and others can no longer 
uh, block access to information. As long as the people in those countries can get access to information, uh, as Ron Paul liked to say, like to say, we don't need the government uh, seeing more of what we do. We need to see more of what the government is doing. If the people have encryption and if the people have free flow of information, I think that uh, people can organize on their own and figure out what they need to do to to bring about uh, uh, liberalization of markets and liberalization of democracies. Sure. Uh, last foreign policy question, then we'll get into uh, a mix of foreign policy, domestic policy, and that, that being immigration. But first, let's talk a little bit about Mexico. As you know, Mexico has had a very long and complicated relationship with the United States. Uh, President Trump wanted to have a border wall. Um, others have wanted to have open borders. And then there have been other politicians who favored more of a, a mixed approach in sort of uh, stopping the flow of illegal immigration and also dealing with Mexico. Um, one of the other candidates seeking the Reform Party nomination, Rocky De La Fuente, uh, the other night, talked about having an economic development zone in between uh, the United States and Mexico um, along, the, along the border and between Texas and Chihuahua and, and other places. Uh, what would be your approach to building the relationship with Mexico and, and U.S. policy towards Mexico? Uh, Pro-immigration, secure borders. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I, I, I got to have a disclaimer. I, I am a legislator in New Hampshire, and our border is with Canada. And I spoke in front of committee about the career criminals uh, coming across the border with Canada, and they laughed. Uh, but, of course, the, the legislators from from northern New Hampshire don't laugh. They have a big problem with career criminals going back and forth across that border. When the heat gets hot in Canada, drug dealers and thieves and, and, and weapons traffickers and human traffickers will come down into northern New Hampshire, northern Vermont, Maine, but especially New Hampshire uh, and northern New, New York. Um, and it, it's actually, it, it's a serious problem, just as piracy is a serious problem uh, mm -hmm. on international waters. Uh, as far as uh, the border with Mexico, I think we have to to work cooperatively with the Mexican government to address those problems. Again, carrot and stick, offer investment, diplomacy, uh, information, technology, um, sharing of intelligence if, if necessary to to kind of crack down on uh, weapons traffickers and uh, illegal drug trafficking along the border. Um, I would... For enforcement, I don't think that mass deportations work. They tried that in the 1950s, and Eisenhower put a stop to it because he saw it was really kind of counterproductive. Um, deport on arrest, stop sanctuary cities. I led the floor debate in the New Hampshire House in favor of House Bill 232, which would have stopped sanctuary cities. Uh, people are waking up and finding out that their town or their city or their, their school district has been or their whole state has been turned into a sanctuary city and their police are not allowed to enforce federal immigration laws. They're being told in California that police are not even allowed to contact uh, federal officials if they have someone they believe is dangerous and may be part of Latin American drug cartel or have ties to prison gangs or what have you. Um, in the war on drugs, I think that the illegal black market drug traffic is supplying a lot of the, 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 the problems that we face. Um, and finally, go after companies. Go after companies like Tyson Foods that replaced 80% of their workers with illegal immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, Americans have seen and green card holders have seen that they've lost out on jobs on federal contracts, on bridge construction contracts and others. Uh, other projects that are supposed to go to American citizens and even some defense related jobs. And uh, when we have Americans here at home who need work, as uh, Ross Perot said, and as Governor Ryan Lamb said, I think almost every single Reform Party presidential candidate has said, when we have Americans here at home who need work, uh, it doesn't make sense to allow these multinational corporations to change our immigration policy and subvert our immigration policy sure. and flood the labor market with just millions and millions of uh, illegal immigrants, people who are brought in illegally, um, estimates estimates of 11 million to 30 million people who are here illegally. Uh, I think that we've got to get serious about first simplifying our immigration policy. So it's just, you know, one simple form, one simple uh, criminal background check and medical check, and it shouldn't be a big bureaucratic process to come in. But but uh, the, the the process should be simpler and a lot less red tape and a lot less bureaucratic. But whatever immigration policies the American people decide on, I think we've got to commit to that. 
Sure. And, and just to close the loop on immigration, because we have many millions of people who are here who are undocumented, living in this country for a long time. We certainly have children who have been brought here by their, by their families or, or sent here by families in, in Central America and elsewhere. Um, how would you approach those folks as far as, uh, as immigration is concerned? Do you favor allowing people to become citizens who have, who have come here illegally? Do you prefer that just providing documentation? Um, what would be your approach for, for handling those groups of, of people who are here in the United States? Uh, they're currently allowed to through military service, but some people are, are too old to enter the military. I think that there should be some kind of national or international uh, service, some work that you can perform to earn citizenship. Um, there is the there uh, is the problem of overstays, which are about 40% of illegal immigrants are actually people who came in here legally the first time. Mm -hmm. They've applied for some type of extension and their paperwork has been delayed or lost. And somebody came here legally, they came in the right way. And now all of a sudden they've been, they're told now you're an illegal immigrant or they discover after the fact, uh, they discover when they're arrested that they're that they're here illegally, even though they, they didn't realize that at the, at the time. Um, something's got to be done for overstays. Um, I think that we need to have some kind of deferred action for uh, people who are children of illegal immigrants. They didn't come here illegally themselves. They were brought into the country. Uh, and it, it's not a matter of a choice. It's not that they tr trespassed into the country. It's just that they were brought along with their family. And we need to, uh, to uh, do something for them. Sure. Let's turn it back uh, to more of, about the election and, and ballot access and other kinds of questions. Um, as you know, as an independent candidate, we've seen uh, the president uh, come in and, and run on a promise of draining the swamp. Uh, but as an independent candidate, um, you're going to be faced with the swamp at really kind of full strength. Uh, he hasn't done very much to drain the swamp. If anything, he's just replaced it with his own swamp in a lot of ways. Um, how would you deal with all of the special interest groups, the lobbyists, and, and the organizations that really have a vested interest in maintaining power between the two parties uh, if you came in as an independent political force? With the veto pen. Mm -hmm. uh, half of what the president does, half of the president's powers come from the veto pen and the ability to, to, to threaten these omnibus budget bills and tax bills that come in with $400 billion in special corporate tax breaks for large corporations, $300 billion in tax breaks and tax avoidance and tax evasion. Uh, uh, yes, I think that English should be the official language. Actually, by the way, disclaimer, that's uh, uh, part of the Veterans Party of America platform. I'm a member of the Veterans Party of America. Um, um, I'm sorry, I totally lost my train of thought. That's right. You were talking. You were talking about. <laughs> that's right. You were talking about battling uh, the special interest groups, and and you talked about the power of the veto pen and the ability of the president to to wield that as as a way of of preventing um, special interest groups from having too much control. And the other half of of the president's power is appointments. Right. Um, what's been happening is presidents have, uh, or I should say, administrations have that Rolodex. And when they want to fill an appointment, they have been going right to the Council on Foreign Relations number and they call and they say, can you fill this position with someone from CFR in, in foreign policy? And we end up with the Council on Foreign Relations, mm -hmm. uh, end up with a Council on Foreign Relations uh, uh, foreign policy rather than uh, uh, an American foreign policy that the American people would support. Um, the other, other problem with appointments is that there's been this revolving door system of uh, corporations not only supplying their own lobbyists, but supplying their own regulators. Sure. So you have chemical companies, oil companies, uh, companies like Monsanto, uh, other multi-billion dollar corporations, banks, Goldman Sachs, um, all these Wall Street firms, uh, essentially supplying their own uh, regulators using the federal government to, to regulate their own industries. Most people see the first problem that they tend to, to be preferential and provide uh, favors to uh, the companies that they come from. A lot of people don't realize that you have, um, how do I put this? 
there's been a tendency for big business to over our whole country's history to use big business to use government licensing regulations and red tape and mm -hmm. tax policy to block competition from their smaller competitors. So for example, in airlines, large airlines have used FAA regulations to block competition in smaller airports. So you have to pay in some cases twice as much, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes three times as much to travel to and from smaller airports. Um, I combated this as a legislator when I saw that um, internet service providers were blocking competition using deals with small towns, town governments and city governments. So you only have one or two uh, Metrocast, Fairpoint, and Comcast were cornering the market. So you really only had one choice or two choice of internet service providers. And then they were, they were charging you three times as much. Uh, lot, I know a lot of communities that, that found that their HOAs or other organizations mm -hmm. got them into those kinds of deals and that uh, yeah. they regretted that. They were trying to get out of them. Uh, big Pharma is using patent abuse. They're using mm -hmm. the FDA's 10 to 18 year approval process to block competition. Mm -hmm. So uh of course in the third party movement we're pro market we're not we're not pro business we're certainly not anti business right uh, but the vast majority of small business owners and consumers and and retirees and people who live on fixed incomes they can't afford to pay three times as much for prescription drugs utilities fuel heating almost mm -hmm. twice as much for electricity and so on and so on uh, one of the questions that just came in from the delegate and i have a couple of others as well um what about having internet access regulated like telephone companies and other utilities, which is that something that you would support or you prefer a different approach? Uh, well, that is interstate commerce. Uh, what the founding father said in the constitution, uh, article one, section eight, they give Congress the authority to regulate interstate commerce. But what that means is to, uh, to make regular, um, to set standards for weights and measures and labeling and that kind of thing. Uh, what's happened is, as, I, as I've said, uh, these big established companies have used their connections and used government regulations to block competition in the marketplace. So it's kind of like saying, do you support having a knife? Well, everyone supports having a knife, but there's a big difference between using a knife for preparing food versus uh, going up and stabbing a guy or robbing somebody. Right, right now, regulations are being used as a weapon against American consumers instead of protecting American consumers. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you mentioned that you're a part of the, the Veterans Party. I know that you also many years ago were, were part of United We Stand of America, uh, the organization that, that came out of the Perot campaign in, in 92. Uh, some of the delegates have asked, and they've asked this of all the candidates, uh, what would you do to help build the Reform Party? Obviously, this election is, is certainly one important piece, but like any political party, we're trying to grow and, and have an influence and become a political alternative uh, to the to the Democrats and Republicans. So what would be your plan for building the party and, and how do you see that shaping up over this campaign and, and in the future? Uh, realistically, in and this is true in other countries, minor parties, especially small parties with very small membership, mm -hmm. uh, the only races that you can win are usually nonpartisan races, the really local races. Mm -hmm and uh, legislative races. Those are totally winnable. Um, and there are three, it, I think that the presidential candidate's purpose is to kind of organize the whole party first mm -hmm. and some kind of strategy that, that we can all agree on um, to get people elected. And secondly, to, to build membership, to kind of show people what's our place, what's, whether it's through the Veterans Party of America or the Reform Party, or if we you know pull together, or if we bring in people from the Alliance Party, uh, um, and some other groups, um, Constitution Party, uh, it looks like is uh, coming apart. So there might be some opportunity to, to, to bring some of the people from there and from the Life and Liberty Party, uh, but giving a clear mission. And, and that is to target legislative races, legislative and local races, county, county sheriff, of, of course, prosecutor, prosecutorial, stopping prosecutorial abuse. Um, and so especially in first past the post countries like Canada and Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the minor parties really understand that their national leader is really kind of a salesman for explaining why you need to join the reform party, why mm -hmm. you need to get involved. Um, of course, membership is free. You, you know, you just go on the line as I did and mm -hmm. type in your name and address and you become a member of the reform party. Um, but it would be much, much better, I think, to 
to make it clear that we're targeting, you know, the 7,400 legislative races. There are about 2,000 of those races that always go Democrat every single year, no matter what, no matter what you do. There are about 2,000 of those races that always go Republican every single year. So from the vantage point of the voter, let's say if we just always avoid swing voting races, which I think that, that we have to when we're, we're tiny and don't have a ton of money, uh -huh. you know that if you see a Reform Party candidate, that means that that race is either reform versus Republican or that race is reform versus Democrat, then you know that there's, as, as Bev Kennedy brings up, uh, mm -hmm. how do you get that wasted vote syndrome? All you do is you avoid the, is it 20 or 22% of races on your ballot that are swing voting races? All of the rest either always go Republican or always go Democrat. If the reform party just hypothetically always focused every single time on entrenched Democrat districts and entrenched Republican districts, mm -hmm. you could always safely vote for the Reform Party candidate every single time. It's something we'd have to do uh, nationwide as a, as a political party. We've, I brought this up with the Veterans Party of America. I actually brought this up with the Libertarian Party, and there mm -hmm. were just enough people who angrily rejected that idea. They wanted to have libertarians running everywhere. And when you have, when they're just kind of scattered everywhere, you know, some guy running for dog catcher, some guy running for county commissioner, they're never running as a team. They never pull together. Um, right. It's like herding cats, and 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 they're consistently struggling with what is it? Zero point eight percent of the vote in federal races, and that's that really feels like a wasted vote because it's it's very easy for the media to just kind of ignore them. But sure. if you're getting out of seventy four hundred legislative races, if we make a target of uh, winning a thousand of those races over the next decade, mm -hmm. uh, then all of these state legislatures that all for the whole legislature always has a Republican majority every time, always has a Democrat majority every time. We'd be able to kind of break that up and uh, um, using a tool called tactical voting, mm -hmm. uh, get people uh, voting reform party every time they see us in a legislative race and uh, uh, prevent big pharma, uh, big agricultural firms, developers, trial lawyers, union officials, bureaucrats, school administrators from having out and out control over the legislature. Sure. Uh, I know we're running a little bit out of time, and I want to make sure that I, I give you a moment uh, at the end to, to sum up your your key um, positions and why people should vote for you. But before we uh, before we do wrap things up, a few few more issues. Um, as president, you would obviously get a chance more than likely to have at least one appointment to the Supreme Court. Uh, it's possible to, uh, you never know. And, and of course the Supreme Court has become a really important fixture over the last uh, 20 years in American politics, much more so than, than even really ever before. Um, particularly with a lot of the recent court rulings that have come down. Uh, how would you approach appointing a Supreme Court justice? Do you have a particular litmus test, uh, specific standards and things that are that are an absolute must for you? Uh, and do you have a particular jurist in the Supreme Court, either past or, or present, that you you would model your selection after? Uh, well, I would actually on the Washington State Supreme Court, we had a judge named Justice Richard Sanders, mm -hmm. and he voted consistently every single time to protect your constitutional rights. Every single time he followed his constitutional oath of office. Um, I'm getting uh, a little bit tired of hearing Republicans say, well, you know, our most of our judges follow the Constitution most of the time. That's that's not following the Constitution. That's just saying, well, we're the lesser of two evils. Well, why do you want people to show up and vote for your for your candidate if they're if, if that's what you're going to put on the billboard, we're 37 percent less corrupt than the Democrats. I, I don't I think that it, that drives people to 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 want to say, I'm going to support that guy. I'm going to get behind that guy because he's, you know, the judges he appoints sometimes follow the Constitution. Um, right. And in fact, uh, we've seen with Brett Kavanaugh, he uh, appointed by Trump. He wrote the Patriot Act, mm -hmm. very unconstitutional law. Um, so I think that when we're when we get down to a judicial appointments, we need people who will follow the Constitution consistently, who will oppose uh, this increased growth in executive power, unchecked executive branch power mm -hmm. that judges need to understand and enforce the separation of powers. The mm -hmm. legislative, executive and judicial branch each have their own independent 
function under the Constitution, and you should not have uh, justices essentially rewriting Obamacare or rewriting an unconstitutional federal law the way Justice Roberts did mm -hmm. uh, and trying to make it look like it might follow the Constitution. If, if you have a, a violation of people's Fourth Amendment privacy rights and Fifth Amendment due process rights, then that law is unconstitutional. It should just be stricken down. Sure. Uh, along those lines, actually, it sort of brings an interesting segue. I, was, I wasn't going to bring it up. Um, because of time, but I, I think it's relevant. Uh, Citizens United, uh, it's a case that has drawn a lot of public interest. And if you read the Supreme Court ruling, it was really uh, considered a First Amendment case in which they repealed a part of the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act or the McCain-Feingold. Would you actually support overturning or, or using legislation to try to overturn Citizens United? Or yeah. would you... You would. OK. And uh, I support the Anti-Corruption Act, mm -hmm. which I think should be kind of the centerpiece of the Reform Party going into the 2020 election. I think that we you can really only campaign to a, a, a broad, broad group of people on supporting one thing. I think the Anti-Corruption Act is is it that that explains most of what we're trying to do with campaign finance reform. Of course, mm -hmm. repealing Citizens United get either instant runoff voting, ranked choice voting mm -hmm. or approval voting. I put in an approval voting bill. Um, getting ballot access for third parties. I put in two different ballot access bills for third parties. And I did I did vote uh, for the repeal of Citizens United. I think that that was a, that was a bad decision. I, I think I can understand the reasoning that they were going with, but it, it was it was pretty clear that uh, the decision is so broad in its scope that it allows big moneyed interest groups to influence right. the outcome of elections right before an election. So uh, just in the short time that we have left, I did want to touch briefly on energy environmental policy and then bring it back to the economy and, and your closing thoughts. Um, as you know, we've become a lot more energy independent over the last uh, several years, but we still have an enormous dependence on fossil fuels. We've seen Republicans, particularly Trump, try to push for more drilling, even in environmentally protected areas. Uh, and we've seen Democrats try to push more for more of a progressive a uh, green approach to energy. Um, where do you come out on energy and sort of balancing that with environmental policy? Uh, do you support more drilling? Do you support more green? A combination? What's your your perspective? All of the above. Uh, well, yes, we are becoming energy independent again, uh, but it's because of fracking, and fracking has its limits, and coal has its limits. Sure. In the 200-year supply of coal, but do we want to be burning coal for the next 200 years? Mm -hmm. I would hope that we. Um, what I presented, and I have this on my website, it's just repealing all the taxes, regulations, red tape, mm -hmm. filing fees, and things that get in the way of development of alternative fuels, alternative energies, alternative engines, uh, do more efficient engines, um, more lightweight materials, and uh, alternative means of transportation. I'd like to see the Uber of mass transit come out. I'd like to see... Uh, see what the uh, free market and see what entrepreneurs are able to came up, come up with in wind, tidal, solar, geothermal. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to see our nuclear reactors modernized so that they're safer and more efficient. Um, nuclear power in America is very, very heavily regulated. And if you look at a lot of Western European countries, they, they don't look at nuclear power as this perfect panacea of rainbows and unicorns, but it's much, much better than burning coal. Sure. Um, um, improving uh, building efficiency and uh, uh, especially with uh, public buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there's something we can do with uh, um, municipal grants and municipal loans, low interest loans to uh, towns and cities uh, in exchange for uh, being uh, lead compliant and uh, reducing our overall energy demands. Sure. Uh, you talked a little bit about the and I also do, oh, go ahead. I also do support the, uh, the Baker Schultz plan. Um, which I, which is supported by dozens and dozens of college Republicans, college Democrats, elected officials, newspapers have endorsed it. Um, and it's, I think that it's a good way to reduce our overall output of uh, carbon emissions. Um, and it also does provide a, a, a rebate to each household. I, and it's, it's overall a net job creator rather than, you know, on one hand, you see from the Democrats, their plan is, shut everything down, shut down energy, shut down logging, right. farmers, fishermen, manufacturing, they're killing those jobs. And I think what we've seen from the Republican Party is 
oh no, all those things would be a disaster, so therefore they don't want to do anything about climate change. And yet we've seen the vast majority of Americans want something done to reduce uh, global greenhouse gas emissions, water, methane, mm -hmm. uh, water vapor, CO2 emissions, and, and other carbon emissions. Yeah. Uh, bringing it back to the economy, we can close on this topic area. Um, as you know, the, the COVID pandemic has caused massive economic job loss. Uh, over 40 million Americans are currently unemployed. Um, Andrew Yang kind of popularized during the Democratic debates the idea of a universal basic income. We've seen different different places all across the world experiment with it. I know it's been experimented with in, in some of the Nordic countries. They've They've somewhat abandoned it because a lot of the results they saw, while it made people happier, it didn't really lead to um, job creation or, or things of that nature. So where would you come down? Would you, would you support a universal basic income or would you favor sort of a different kind of approach, something maybe with incentives? Um, what would be your, your idea for that? Actually, Milton Friedman, libertarian economist, uh, came up with this back in the 1960s as an alternative to welfare and, and Part of my 007 plan is, you know, unlike what some folks on the left are trying to do, which is uh, justify an additional two or three trillion dollars in additional spending. Um, I think that the the better way to do it is would be to would be to cut uh, about three trillion dollars in federal, state, and local spending, um, and that's what we do with the 007 plan: is cut overall government spending by this much mm -hmm. about. Um, ten or eleven thousand dollars a year per person in total spending, and then give everyone seven thousand dollars a year per person in tax rebates. I think the tax rebates are a much better way of doing it. It's just six hundred dollars a month that would be added to your health education savings savings account every month. It's a predictable amount, and again, for a family of four, you'd be getting twenty eight thousand dollars a year per family in tax rebates. So. Mm -hmm. For up, you know, middle class and upper income families, of course, that's just a, it's a big tax cut. It would be the largest middle class tax cut in American history, even larger than the Eisenhower tax cut. Mm -hmm. But yet for lower income people and especially people on welfare and people who use a lot of programs, mm -hmm. it would be for them that twenty eight thousand dollars a year would be a replacement for um, government programs. I think someone estimated the total cost of the welfare system is about sixty one thousand dollars per year per household. Mm -hmm. Instead of spending sixty-one thousand dollars a year per household, if they're just getting twenty-eight thousand dollars, it would cost a lot less. It would drastically reduce the budget deficit by by greatly, greatly reducing overall government spending and reducing the demands on uh, federal, state, county, local services and programs. Um, and it would it would allow us to um, reduce spending, reduce taxes uh, for a retired couple. Uh, just living on Social Security and Medicare or someone living on disability mm -hmm. for an elderly couple, um, they would also get the $600 a month each. So instead of just living on $1,500 a month in Social Security, now they'd get the $1,500 plus the $1,200 a month. Um, so that would be a $2,700 a month um, benefit plus Medicare. And I think that would be a, a much, much better alternative to some of the other tax cut plans because it, it it's something that would benefit everyone. It's the most efficient tax system possible. And then you get rid of an enormous amount of federal bureaucracy and uh, the middle class and especially retirees and disabled people. I have a friend in upstate New York who's disabled. Mm -hmm. He gets $700 a month in, in medical benefits and that's what he's got to live on. Sure. With this plan, he'd get, the, he'd get the $700 a month plus the Medicare coverage plus the extra $600 a month he could contribute to his household and not, not be a burden on his family. Sure. Uh, last question, and then we'll get into the closing, your closing statement. Um, you've talked about the national debt. You've talked about, you mentioned Ron Paul and some of your comments and, and, and other things. In 1992, when, when Ross Perot ran, the national debt was right around between three and a half and four trillion dollars. Um, a lot of his ideas about balancing the budget and, and pushing the two parties to cut spending actually resulted in the late 90s with balanced budgets and huge economic growth. Since then, we're now over $23 trillion in debt. We've spent trillions of dollars. In, um, and at this point in time with the pandemic, people are very nervous about hearing people talk about cutting spending. Um, so how would you approach the idea of trying to balance the budget or in, in sort of Ron Paul's 
ideas. Do you think that the national debt has just become so large that there's no way we could ever pay it off? We should just cancel it and, and just start over. No, um, that I think that would be an economic disaster because it would be impossible for us to borrow money. It would right. be almost impossible to main. I think it would destroy our currency. I think that it would um, do enormous damage to the financial markets. Um, it would wipe out investors and retirees. You've got uh, trillions and trillions of dollars in all these pension funds that are invested into that. Um, I, so I think that much better than canceling the debt would be just to balance the budget and start paying it down. Once you balance the budget and start paying down the national debt, um, economists have said that, that just balancing the budget cuts uh, the interest rates, overall interest rates by half a percent to 1%. 1% might not sound like much, but it's $260 billion a year on interest payments right. on the national debt. So just balancing the budget by reducing government spending and uh, lowering and simplifying tax rates to get more economic growth um, going. Um, once you stop throwing trillions and trillions of dollars away on corporate bailouts and uh, foreign military engagements, uh, you get to a balanced budget fairly quickly and that saves you the also the 260 billion in interest on the debt. We could start paying down the national debt. Great. Uh, Max, I wanna give you a moment to just uh, in, a, in a minute or two, just uh, offer your concluding thoughts. Why are, why should people vote for you for president and what are some of your core reasons for that? Well, I have a long history as a candidate of winning lots of votes. Um, my best known opponent is Rocky and he spent, I believe $8 million last year in, his, in the 2016 campaign. And he won a, a, a pretty reasonable 33,000 votes nationwide. I spent about $800 in 2016 on my third party bid, and I won over 31,000 votes. I won almost as many votes just in New Hampshire as Rocky did nationwide. I don't think that when you're a minor party, I don't think that spending a lot of money is, is a good idea. I don't think that that connects with people. I think that you have to talk about the issues that they care about. And at the same time, you've also got to promote your own political party, promote the reform party mm -hmm. as as something to support. And I think we've got to make it absolutely clear what our mission and purpose is. And that is to focus on state and local races, especially legislative races, county council, city council races, and especially in these entrenched Democrat districts and entrenched Republican districts. So you don't have the wasted vote syndrome problem that the other third parties have. I, I think that we can talk about the the nine reform party members who, who were uh, elected in upstate New York uh, just in the last uh, couple of years, um, that that's a big success. I think that we can talk about the growth in membership and the growth in interest in third parties, that over 60% of Americans now say that we need a third party in America, that we can have a presidential candidate who will use the little bit of free media that we have to explain our place and our mission as a, as a, a political party, why we need to have a third party in American politics to focus on a lot of these um, city council races, school board races, and most importantly, legislative races. I'm a two-term legislator myself, and I think uh, I think making the case for, for people, however they might be voting in other races and the presidential race, uh, take a look at the legislative races and support your, your reform party candidates there. Great. Max, thank you so much. I've enjoyed this conversation a great deal. And I know the delegates that appreciate your time and, and I do as well. Uh, best of luck to you on, on Saturday and, and please stay well, stay safe on the campaign trail. That's gonna conclude our live stream tonight. We are gonna make this available, like I said, on our website as well as on the YouTube, uh, our YouTube channel. And um, we thank you so much for joining us this evening. We know there's a lot going on, so we certainly appreciate you making time. But that concludes tonight's presentation. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow.